Hi, it's Pete. I'm here doing a screen cap. I've got my Kindle application up, web application up, and what I wanted to talk about was my Kindle, and that's what I read on now, either the phone app on my, the Kindle phone app on my phone, my Android phone, or the uh, Kindle that I own. I've had a Kindle for years and years. I barely ever used it except when I would fly someplace. Uh, once in a while, I really do prefer physical books. The reason I'm calling my channel Bookless Pete is because I don't have any physical books because I got rid of everything when I gave up my job and gave up my life in Seattle and moved to the road. So I'm traveling along with just electronics and maybe books that I can pick up here and there as I go. Haven't seen many bookstores here in Albania. So, but when I bought the Kindle, I did like, I think a lot of people do, is they dig in uh, to the free books and they start downloading tons and tons of books. And so I have all this stuff on here and sometimes I'll go, I'll be on there buying books and I'll go to buy a book and discover I already own it, either a 99 cent copy or a one dollar or a, a free copy from uh, Project Gutenberg, that kind of thing. So what I did is I opened a bunch of them up to bring them to the top of my list. So I've kind of been excavating my my library here and bringing up stuff that I really want to read. So this is a non-readers episode because it's all stuff I haven't read for the most part. And then there's some things here. This is this Doctor Orient and series uh, is from the 70s. I got most of these free and some special that the publisher was running a few years ago, and they're pretty cool. They're might be good for Garb August or something like that. It's kind of a paranormal uh, investigation type character. Dr. Orient is the third one in the series, I think. No, I'm sorry. Dr. Orient is the first one in the series. Um, I don't want to go through this now. Yeah, there's a few I've read. Lady uh, Baron Orgaze is the next one I have to read, I think. So let me get out of there. Go back to my library. Uh, those are pretty cool. They're kind of cheesy, very 70s, kind of new agey, and kind of sexy, and all kinds of stuff going on. I'm going to skip some of those at the top because I've already decided to do other uh, videos about those. And um, there's just other stuff in here that I've wanted to read for a long time. Like this, this is a great collection here, a cool idea. It's that somebody put together. It's called the Northanger Horrid Novels, and it's the novels that are read by the character. What's her name in Jane Austen's uh, Northanger Abbey? So there's, and this, they're all in one collection. Mysteries of Adolfo by Anne Radcliffe, is one of them, and uh, the Italian by Anne Radcliffe. I think those are the most famous ones. There's some of the others that are listed there. I thought that was a pretty good idea for putting together a you know, a quickie uh, public domain kind of collection. I don't know if it, any of these are still available. Sometimes I go back and stuff's completely gone. Uh, speaking of Anne Radcliffe, these are her diaries. I've heard these are really good, so I forgot I had them, of course. And this is her married name, Madame Darblay, I think. And there's three volumes of them, I believe. And I want to read those. I hear, I hear. In fact, people who I'm sorry. This is not Anne Rancliffe. This is Fanny Burney. Oh my God! All right, I don't know anything, uh, which will become more and more evident as you watch more videos of mine. But I've hear, I've heard she's a very good diarist. I've, and I want to dip into those and see if I enjoy them. This is a book I found someplace called Adventures of an American Girl in Victorian London. She was a young woman who got hired by a newspaper, an American woman, as it says here, <laughs> who got hired uh, to go undercover and work as a domestic in London and report on the, the conditions of how domestics were treated in London society. And in her foreword to the book, she talks about it being part of, as part of the quote unquote new journalism which is a term that would come back and again and again, like there was new journalism in the 70s and I think another time. So she was maybe the first wave of new journalists. And, so, and her name is Elizabeth L. Banks. So I'm going to read that next. 
Other than the things I'm right in the middle of now, I'm going to read that next. Okay, Foresight Saga, I'm going to read. I think I talked about that in another video because I, I watched the series, the 19, the 2005 series, or I don't know, the most recent remake of Foresight Saga, and I had a lot of questions about the, the characters and the generations and that, so it made me really want to read these John Galsworthy books. So I found out I had that on my Kindle, which I didn't know. Um, I saw this in some guy's video talking about uh, different early sci-fi books. Barry Malzberg, I read most of his books when I was growing up. He was one of my favorites. But I missed this one, and it's a pretty well-known one. And there's my, I picked up, uh, I opened up this Conan the Barbarian and uh, anthology the other day so I could reread re -read Tower of the Elephant because I, I'd watched Michael Kivan's video on Tower of the Elephant. I'll talk about Philip K. Dick later. Uh, Henry James I like a lot. I like him a lot. I've read, I finished just, uh, the last physical book I owned was the fifth volume of the, uh, of the Library of America's complete James short stories. So I had read all those. And I read Portrait of a Lady, which I liked very much, and, and Washington Square, which I liked. There's, I have a list of the others. I found a list somewhere of the essential ones to read. This is the next one I'm going to read. This is the complete works. I got this so that I could look at his, his literary uh, essays and his travel writings and things like that, which I might read at some point, but I'm going to read the Sacred Fount and a few of the other of his later novels. I re-downloaded this because of Michael K. Vaughan's Burroughs stuff. I want to reread some of that stuff. Here's a collection you can find of all the public domain Philip K. Dick stories. If you go on, if you're on Kindle a lot or looking at old cheap books, or on Project Gutenberg, you see that there's a lot of early Philip K. Dick stories that he never bothered to renew the copyright back in the era when you had to renew copyrights to keep them. So there's like 10 or 12 stories, I think, that are in the public domain by Dick, so maybe I'll read those sometimes. Sometime. Uh, there's more. Oh, there's another Henry, another complete Henry James. See, see what, see what I do. It's 99 cents. I, I buy it. I don't. And there's like two competing editions, and now I own them both. That was a book I think I got free. It looks kind of interesting though. Uh, there's some Spanish books in here. I'll go into that another time. I'm trying to learn Spanish. Here's some good trashy books. Uh, well, five was clip points, clip joints, not track. Uh, trashy. Frederick Brown, people probably know, he's a very famous early science fiction writer and mystery writer. I read uh, most of his mysteries a long time ago, I think, and I'm not sure if I read this one or not, so I thought this would be a great one to reread, and it was only 99 cents. Sin on Wheels, I just like the cover. There's this uh, paperback. I don't have to go in and look. I don't like going into the fr picture here because because then when I get back out, I'll lose my place. Sit on Wheels, Uncensored Confessions of a Trailer Tramp. Planet Monk Pulp, they do really good pulp. Let's see if I could get the picture here. So, and they're, they have a lot of really cheap stuff. You know, we're living in kind of a renaissance of people bringing out forgotten pulp novels and forgotten, um, you know, old, old uh, movies and stuff that people brought out. There's another Dr. Orient. Oh, I, I see. I keep messing up my order of stuff because I've got it set to just do the oldest first. I mean, the newest, the most recent open first. Peter Rabe is a uh, crime novelist I like. I've read a couple of his books. I think there's one called The Box, which is really strange. The Box is really strange. This guy gets, he works for the mob, and as punishment, he gets nailed into a box and sent on a... <laughs> sent on a, a freighter around the world with fully intent that he'll die, but somehow the box gets opened and, you know, he kind of gets a second chance with with the mob because he they inadvertently rescue him from the box, and it's a very strange book. And there's another more recent book I read, or there's another uh, more well-known book by him I read that was not as good, but I really liked the box. And these are kind of his like sexploitation novels, I think, New Man in the House or High School Lover, uh, you know, from the 50s, like when they would do those those uh, cheesy uh, sex books like Lawrence Block used to write, and a lot of, and a lot of pulp writers used to write 
not under their own name for for uh, you know a little money and is that Peter Rabe also kill the boss goodbye that's how can you pass on that title kill the boss goodbye so he's, he's really working it there with the with the with the long goodbye reference and kill and all that um, okay raw youth I want to read because I'm trying to read uh, the my, the gaps in my in my Dostoevsky, I had read, a long time ago, I read Crime and Punishment and Brothers Karamazov and prob probably the, what's the dark short one that people like read? Uh, notes notes from Underground. Um, uh, but I'd skipped the other long novels. And last year I read Demons and The Idiot. They're both really good. I know that A Rye Youth is not supposed to be nearly as good. This is a Constance Garnett translation. I... I the only contemporary translation of Rye Youth is by Peaver and um, Polanski or whoever, that couple that do them, and I don't really like their translations, and I probably shouldn't go into it. Uh, I'm not an expert on what translations are good or anything, but I've just found them uh, just not as compelling. And when I've read stuff in, transla in translations they've done, like Chekhov, I just find it very forgettable. I, I read, you know, I, I remember really loving Chekhov when I read him before, and then the last couple of years I, I checked out a, a couple audiobooks of the Peaver translations of Chekhov stories, and they just meant nothing to me. They just went right past me. And the same thing with their... Uh, who's the most famous short story writer other than Chekhov in Gogol. Uh, same with their Gogol collection. I just thought, like, oh, man, when I was young, I loved Gogol so much, and then I read this Peaver anthology, and I was like, well, I, I don't know. But then I found other, you know, online, I read that people, other people have this issue with their translations, apparently. There are a couple, her name is Volonsky or Vronsky, or doesn't matter. She does a literal translation and he goes and he rewrites her literally transcribed English into straightforward English. Because, and he doesn't speak Russian at all, so he's never read the books he's translating in Russian in their own language, which I, I don't know, I kind of think would be a requirement that the translator at least would be able to read the, the language, even if they're not an expert, even if they're not native. Uh, this is kind of a famous book that people in the go the kind of like a cult readership that this book has, the uh, Extraordinary Delusions, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, several volumes, all free. A lot of Spanish here that I can't read, yet I am working on reading Spanish, so uh, here's a cozy, Simon Brett, I guess people probably know, it's kind of a cozy small town England Books, I haven't touched them yet. That was another freebie, nearly freebie. Zed McBain's, I've read the first few. I want to get through them. Uh, there's probably like 50 Ed McBain's, I, th I think. Criminal, 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 Criminali has a good uh, Ed McBain thing going on. I think he's trying to read all their books. So there's this this writer, all these by Javier Casanova, this strange fictionalized series about the uh, the the life of Hitler, uh, anti-fascist writer Javier Casanova, who I believe is an independent writer. Uh, I got those free, so I'm going to check those out because he wrote something else that that I liked. But his books are only available in Spanish. I'm working on my Spanish. I'm getting better, and it's a goal of mine to be able to read in it, and I'm using a method called comprehensible input. So I'm trying to spend as many hours a day as I can learning Spanish. It's one of my other hobbies. Cairo Trilogy, one of my friend's favorite uh, book. Um, who was, oh yeah, I don't know how to say this name, Mafuz. One of my friend's favorite novelists, so I bought that on his recommendation. 
Garth Marenghi from the the old uh, BBC series Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, which is I can't even describe it. It's so funny. Garth Marenghi is a is a character, fictional character, who's, who's supposedly a a British horror writer from the horror boom boom of the eighties, um, hack writer who just dumped him out, and he actually wrote. And there's and it's a one season, you know, six episodes or whatever BBC series, which you got to see Garth Marenghi's Dark Place if you like horror novels and you like uh, comedy, absurd comedy. Then a couple of years ago, the one of the creator of the series wrote this this novella here, but I'm ready it. So another, you know, there's another Henry James. Oh my God. Um, Edith Wharton's Ghoster. I love Edith Wharton too, along with uh, with Henry James. I read a lot of Edith, Edith Wharton. I've read most of her major novels now. I want to read. I still got to read The Buccaneers. I haven't read that. And here's the just a collection of her ghost stories, which I don't think I've read. I've read some of her uh, shorter works, uh, Bunner Tale, the Bunner, Bunner Sisters, and and which is a novella, which was the first thing I read by her is really good. It's really kind of heartbreaking ending. This is a kind of rural England kind of semi comic novel that I got because I like, well, I love Woodhouse and I and I very much like uh, Map and Lucia and those kind of things. So I'm hoping this is in the same vein. I haven't started it yet. Uh, Howard Brown is a pulp writer. This is a public domain. J.B. Priestley, I've heard always good things about this. Uh, more Ed McBain's. I see. I just keep buying these Ed McBain's. You go on, you go on Amazon, click on the series. You know, go to Ed McBain and click on the eight, the eighty-seven precinct series, and it brings a drop down. And there's always different ones that are marked down to ninety-nine cents. So whenever there's a ninety-nine cent one, I buy it, and I'm collecting the whole series that way. And I really should get going on this. It's a bit embarrassing how many. Stanley Ellison. Stanley Ellen, a great writer. I haven't read his novel, so I decided to just treat myself and buy them all. I, I'm I'm a big fan of his short stories. His most famous short story is his first short story, The Specialty of the House. Maybe that'll r bring a uh, ring a bell with some people if they've read a lot of like old mystery anthologies. It's a it's a great one. Don't want to spoil it for you. It's also been adapted in, you know, various radio plays and things like that. Spicy mysteries. You know, there's these wild side mega packs. They're called. They're usually ninety nine cents. Sometimes they're forty nine cents. Sometimes they're even nineteen cents, where they collect a lot of uh, forgotten pulp stories under different themes. The spicy pulps were a little, a little more supposedly titillating ones. Uh, more in McBain, more in McBain, more in McBain. Some drawing stuff, some drawing stuff I tried to do. Comic book drawing things. Freebie to create uh, for the Destroyer series, which I've I read one of those once. One of the later episodes of the Destroyer series are pretty off the hook. All right, so some more drawing. I, I do sketching for fun. There's a bunch of... These uh, spider novels, I went on a binge of buying these too. I'm still working through them. I've probably read about 30 of them. I've read all the ones you could get in print. And then I started going back and trying to... There's 118 novel, f spider novels altogether. There's a lot of good video YouTube booktubers discussions of the spider. Really great action-packed adventure stories, the spider. There was a few different people have issued different ones. There was like the Bane Books trilogy. Uh, I mean, Bane Books issues, and I think the, probably the best ones I've read so far. And there was Carol, Carol and Graf publications from maybe the 90s or so, where they they put, they put out about, I think, eight volumes with two in them each. So that was like 16 of the novels. So I have a big spreadsheet somewhere of all the ones I've read and all the gaps, and I'm trying to go back and fill in the gaps. Probably the best print book that I read, if you wanted to get one, is The Spider vs. the Empire State, which is three novels in the the so-called Black Police 
trilogy and their right and they're in the 30s and New York City gets taken over by like a fascist political a fascist political party who puts their own government who puts their own mayor in charge and their own police force called the black police and somehow they get somehow they manage to get away with this without the federal government getting upset and they put in their own tax system and they you know and it's a lot of graft and stuff and so the spider takes care of them but it takes them three books because that's just how evil they are um, you can see all my other failed language attempts I don't know what that is I don't even remember that okay so that's pretty much here's here's some more of the okay here's another series I want to read uh, Honey West who's a I think there's about 13 of these that were reissued. Here they are. Or nine or something, which I know from this one season series from the 60s with Anne Francis playing the character Honey West, who it was a spinoff of Burke's Law. And that series was pretty weak overall. One, one season of a... American TV show in those days was probably like 30 episodes. There's probably like five or six really good ones. Half-hour crime shows. I really had high hopes for it. But, so I'm hoping the books are better. You can see, you know, some of these publishers who put out these reissues, I mean, God bless them for doing it. But these, to me, these covers don't cut it. These stock art covers, they don't really evoke the era. And G.D. Flickling was a married couple, a man and a woman, who wrote about nine of these, about one of the earliest female private eyes. Here's two books written by the actor George Sanders, a, George, a ghost written by other people. One of these, and I'm not sure which one now, was actually written by Lee Brackett. And Lee Brackett, people, readers probably know that she was a great, Pulp science fiction writer. She wrote uh, planet story type things. You know, I forget. I think her character. I don't want to say the name of her character because I'll mess it up. Because there's two writers I'm thinking of has similar characters, but you know, kind of an adventurer, kind of an Indiana Jones on Mars and on on other planets, like trying to get. Uh, get stuff to sell and but she also wrote mysteries she uh, in the uh, the pantheon of american fiction and american cinema rather she's probably best known as the for having her name on the script for the second star wars movie and why i can't remember the name of that stupid movie or actually, I guess it's the fifth Star Wars movie because we have to deal with that. But, oh, The Empire Strikes Back, or, or I think she was working on it, and it, then she had died, and so a lot of her work, unfortunately, didn't make it into the final drafts because she wasn't available to keep working on them. But they left her name on there to honor her career because her, you know, her first big screenplay that people know was the adaption of The Maltese Falcon, the classic Walt John Houston version which Lee Brackett and William Faulkner adapted and I think there was someone else credited to or maybe it was just John Houston and her work on Rio Bravo the great uh, John Wayne movie with Ricky Nels Rick Nelson and Dean Martin and that's a great movie so she wrote in in all genres, and she ghosted one of these two George Saunders mysteries. I don't know which one. The other one's ghosted by someone else. So I bought those. House on the Borderland. I've read that a couple times. Very strange book. Red Nails, of course, I've got other copies of this, but I really like Red Nails, so it's nice to have its own copy so I don't have to go searching around. There's more Lee Brackett stuff. I could guess I could look in there. Here's, here's one of these mashups, these Sherlock Holmes mashups that are coming out now because of the 
situation of the public domain. I think that's a freebie. So, let's see. So the ones at the top here, let's see all kinds of stuff you could just download from on, on your Kindle from that were carried over from Project Gutenberg that, you know, just silly stuff like this. I don't know if I'll ever read these Fu Manchu books. I, I read the first couple, I think. They didn't really grab me that much. And these and more of these I have a ton of these somewhere, these these mega packs. And some of them I don't even know which is which. Um, I got these this, these John M. Ford Star Trek novels when there was some article in Slate, I think it was, or something about John M. Ford, this great forgotten directors and, and this great forgotten writer, and And at the time, it, his stuff was only coming back in print. The only things that were right, we were actually in print, were the, his two Star Trek novels, which I gotta say, they didn't really do much for me, so I kind of forgot about reading John Ford after that. And then these other two I got at the same time because they were like 99 cents. I was interested in this one because she's a well known writer. Barbara Hamlet is a well known mystery writer. So I kind of wanted to see what, what her take on a on Star Trek would be. Psychomania is, is an anthology of, is it? I almost said Jack the Ripper stories, but I think, so it's obviously it's, it's Robert Block and, okay, wrote an uncle Psycho. So I think it's just, it's in memory of Robert Block, what's going on here? So these are various, it's kind of like a, I can't seem to find, There's a Basil Copper story in there. Okay, so it's just uh, an anthology of stories on the theme of psychos. Uh, let's see if it, Basil Copper, if this is a Solar Pond story, maybe. Anyway, so I just kind of wanted to show my Kindle and kind of the things I'm going to start to try and read on it because, like I said before, I've had a Kindle a long time and I've just collected stuff on it without even reading much on it because I preferred physical books, but the last couple of months I've been reading a lot on it and enjoying it. So it's not it's not perfect, but it certainly beats lugging a tiny library around with you from country to country or trying to find out find books that people have left in hotels and or Airbnbs and which people don't really do anymore. There's not just paperbacks lying around like there used to be in my day. So I'm gonna cut it there. I wish I could say I was cutting it short, but this has probably been long enough, and I will see you again sometime.